Hi, I'm Tanil. And I'm Kelsey. And we're financial advisors from Allman Partners True Wealth, bringing you thought provoking conversations around you, your money, and your life on the Wealth Experience Podcast. Welcome. Today, Kelsey and I want to dive into a very interesting topic, the psychology of money. And no, we're not psychologists ahead of time, so just bear with us. Um, So money is something that we all deal with on a daily basis, whether we're earning it, spending it, saving it or investing it. Uh, But have we ever really stopped to have a think about how psychology influences your relationship with money? In today's podcast, we're going to explore some key concepts related to the psychology of money and how they impact our financial decision making. Kelsey, one of the books that I've enjoyed me- reading the most uh, on financial, on the financial side of things is Morgan Housel's The Psychology of Money. Mm, it's a great book. Yeah, it's a really good one. So for any listeners that love a good audio book, this is one for you. Um, one of the most important aspects uh, that I drew from that around the psychology of money is this emotional connection that we have with our money. Uh, It can really bring out a range of different emotions in us. Some people, when they think about money, can come from a place of fear or anxiety. Others at times can have excitement or joy. And really our own upbringing, our personal situation and experiences, and even our cultural background, that can all play a role in shaping our emotional relationship with money. Um, Really some some examples of this is probably the best way of starting off. and I think one that's uh, interesting to talk about is the, the idea around success and how that plays out with money. Um, so, you know, you can come from a position where um, you, you might be ashamed to talk about money. So whether whether your upbringing was that you had a lot or you had a little, um, you might feel guilty or a little embarrassed to really be talking about it when other people might see financial success and equate that with their, with self, self-worth. Um, So understanding those emotional connections to money can really help us make a more informed uh, financial decision. Mm. Mm. Uh, I guess for me personally, I can can see how those things have played out at times. So uh, even just a simple example that I have is when my husband and I first met and we first went to a Christmas with family, um, we, you know, my background was that we didn't didn't have a lot of money. We, we really didn't. And so even the idea of spending it now, um, we might have gotten a present at Christmas time or wrapped a present for somebody under the tree. Um, and his family was very different. They, they really expressed their love um, through gift giving. So mm. for me to sit in a room with, with, you know, many, many gifts being opened, it actually was very, it, it did, it brought out a lot of anxiety. And, and uh, for me, because I'm looking at it going, oh my goodness, it just feels, it feels too much. It feels, you know, it feels yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, but as I say, for other people, that's a, a great expression of the love that you have. That's their love language. That's right. That, mm. That's their love. Exactly right. Um, and it's, it is important that we know the emotions that it draws out in one another um, when we're talking to people about money or even understanding ourselves and our intrinsic values with money there. Um, so, Kels, maybe you could just talk a little bit about some of the tools that you actually use to help people understand some of those emotional connections they have with money. Yeah, and thanks for sharing, to me, first of all. And I think, yeah, there's certainly a lot of emotion that we don't realise that does go around um, how we deal with finances and our thoughts and, and feelings around around money. And I think that something that's been really powerful that we've implemented personally and, and professionally too across the team um, is to have a dream board. And I think that that's a really important process because you actually have to sit down, think about it and visualise it. And in doing that process, you tie the emotional to it and then when you put it together um, on a piece of paper, it, it kind of it, you're allowed then to tie your emotions every time you reflect back on that dream board to go, how would I feel when I achieve this? So when you're talking about a dream board, you're not talking about, you know, this is what I dreamed about last night. No, no. You're talking about goals? I'm absolutely talking about goals, yeah. So what are some of those key things that you want to achieve? What do your dreams and aspirations look like? And to sum that up as a picture perhaps, you know, whether that's next year I want to go on a skiing holiday in Japan and have that picture there or I want to spend more time with my family, all of those things. You know, sometimes this does mean that you've got to have the money to be able to support those goals but you're taking it away from money to What do I want to experience? How do I want to live my life? What are the things that I really want to achieve that are important to me, 
based on my values. Yeah, and I suppose pictures are a really good way because it, it ties to to um, you know to that emotional centre of me pretty quickly if I'm looking at it and visualising it in that way. That's right. And you can al- always use that then to, you know, a year down the line, look back and go, well, these are all the things that I've achieved and I quite like lists and ticking things off. <laughs> and I think it's quite good to be able to go back to that, to go, well, I've done all of these things. Um, you know, and there's also a side to that as well that's interesting that if you don't actually go back and reflect on what you've achieved over, you know, an increment of time, say a year, because um, it does have to be often enough to be powerful, you don't go back and, and look and go, wow, look at all these things that I've been able to do. You can fall into the trap of being like, okay, what's next on the list of goals? What else do I need to do with my money? What do I need to achieve? Um, And there's a really good book on this that talks about this concept by Dan Sullivan called The Gap in the Gain. And he talks to this, um, you know, in a way that you have to appreciate what money has afforded you to be able to do. And looking back and going, well, this is what I have achieved. This is how I felt. Isn't this so awesome? Rather than being in that trap of I've got to get more and more and more. Um, And I think that, you know, it's, it's... Important to know why. That comes down to your why. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that idea. So the gap, the gap in the gain. You know, ha- taking a moment, taking a breath to look back. Um, like you say, you like your list, be able to tick that off, but then then tie to that and kind of go, how am I feeling at the moment? Now that I've had the opportunity to do that ski holiday or to meet my house deposit or whatever mm. it might be, how, how do I? How does that make me feel? Yeah. Um, and getting that, you know, joining back that emotional connection. Um, with the financial goal. Absolutely. Right? And I've used that personally in my own life and it's only something I've, I've started to do personally in the past few years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, when, you, when you're busy and you're trying to achieve a lot and you're trying to fit all these things in your life, you're constantly just trying to get to the next thing and, and make it happen and then life moves on and disappears and then all of a sudden you've gone, well, I haven't actually taken the time to appreciate all of the things that I have done. Because mm, we're all really good at saying, well, what's next? What's next? Right. You know, what's on the horizon? But yeah, looking looking back in the rear view mirror is just as important. Mm, smell the roses. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we need to, just going back to, you know, we've got to know why. Why do we need money? How do we want to use it? And I'll give you an example of, um, you know, people that haven't had money before in their lives. There's two things that can happen. One can be, I've never had money, so I'm spending it and buying all of these wonderful things that I want to outwardly show, well, now I have money, okay? That's an emotional tie. Or you go the other way, and it kind of leads back to what you were saying around the Christmas time, to know, well, I haven't had money before, so I don't want to spend it, and I'm going to be regal, really frugal and hoard it all away because of the fear of not having it in the future. And I think that if you're constantly tied up in these you know, emotions with money and not really understanding what it's there to do for you... Um, you're not going to have that satisfaction. You know, you're always going to be not living your life to the full yeah. based on what's important to you. And I think if you sit down and you get it on a piece of paper and actually spend the time to think about it, you have more successful, meaningful outcomes long term with your money. Yeah. And I guess it's not just for yourself personally, neither, is it? If you're in a in a relationship, how, how mm. important do you think it is that um, people in a couple actually understand that you know perhaps when I'm making a major financial decision, it's it might be exciting to me. So I want to I want to go and spend, you know, a million dollars now and buy this be- a beautiful house, and that's going to make me feel excited. Is it going to make my my husband or my my partner feel excited, or is it going to make them feel anxious? Mm. It's absolutely important to have those joint conversations you know you, you still have your separate goals absolutely but you've got to think about how do they impact what you both want to achieve together and how do you both feel about that mm. because you know you, you might come into some relationship troubles if you've brought the million dollar house that your partner doesn't feel comfortable you know they don't feel comfortable with that level of debt you know it's it's not important to them they'd rather have three holidays a year than have to spend money on the house so I think you, you've got to be on the same page and find the right compromise mm. and it's important to do that ahead of time and have those open conversations Absolutely. Yeah. Great tips. Well, I guess um, back to the, the big picture psychology of money now. Um, some of those, there's another important aspect really that we should be speaking a little bit about, and, and that's cognitive biases. Mm, interesting. Yeah, some technical words <laughs> in here. Um, and, and really, these are biases are, are those mental shortcuts that we use when we make decisions because we know, we all know our brains are lazy, right? I want to be able, my brain wants to be able to go, all right, this is the decision I've made, and I feel like I, I've, 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 
well thought that out, but I might have made it in the tenth of a second. <laughs> um, and often we do these these mental shortcuts without even realizing it. So cognitive biases they really lead us to make a ra sometimes irrational or suboptimal financial decisions. Um, I wanted that dress. I saw it on the mannequin. I went out and bought it, and then I immediately didn't feel good about it um, because I spent one hundred and sixty dollars on a on, on a dress that I hadn't put any thought towards. Mm. You yeah, know, why, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it was a great idea in the spur of the moment. <laughs> yeah, and I think you've got to really assess why. That's right. Where did that come from? That's exactly right. Yeah, stop, think, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there's a, there's a, a, a sunken cost fallacy um, that can lead us to, it, it, on the other side of things, so now I'm talking about investing, it can actually lead me to hold on to something, to hold on to an investment for a longer period than I should have because I've already invested money or, or it could be time into it. Um, and, and this is what, this this one here, it's really, we see this at play um, at times when people are investing. Do you want to give an example of, of where you might have seen this kind of cognitive bias? Mm, absolutely. I, we see it the most in, in the cryptocurrency. You know, there's yes. there's certainly been some volatility in that space. That's the that's the type of investment that it is. And you know, there was a period of time there where people were holding crypto, um, and it was doing really well. The, the returns are absolutely phenomenal, and then all of a sudden it drops, and um, people hold on to that. Because their belief is that it's going to come back. It has to come back. And when you talk about drop, you're not talking about one or two percent here. No, we're we're talking pretty significant. You know, sixty percent. Yeah. Okay, that's a significant amount of your capital um, that's been wiped off the table. But people want to believe they've made the right decisions, and you know they know what they're doing, and they they, they hold it and they wait for it to come back. Um, you know, and that's just talking to the sunk cost fallacy. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it's true because if you don't have the right underlying investments, there's no guarantees. You know, but we've seen this happen with the cryptocurrency. You know, they go broke. Yeah. yeah, they can go broke, and then there is no coming back, no matter how long you hold on to that asset for. Yeah. Um, and there's probably, you know, uh, that's a really great example because um, we know the we know the old adage: we we want to buy low and we want to sell high. So mm. people people's argument may be when they've lost, they feel that they've already lost money, and um, you know they're holding on to an asset that's the sinking ship. Mm. But they might use that and say, well, I don't want to sell low. Mm -hmm. And the idea is I, I'm in the sunk cost fallacy. I'm saying I've already put my money into it. I don't want to lose money because I've already put that there. But now I'm using a confirmation bias over the top of that. And I'm saying that I don't. I feel that I don't want to be selling out of an asset at this point in time. So a confirmation bias is now that I go out and seek out information that confirms my existing beliefs mm. about money rather than considering all the evidence that's on the table. So the, the evidence might say, well, uh, perhaps at this point in time, you should be looking at something that's a bit more diversified. Um, but I will actually go out there and find information that says, no, I'm, I'm correct in my decision making and I'm going to continue to hold this asset. Um, do you think um, maybe you could give another example of that confirmation bias? Well, I think it's when people think that they can beat markets. OK, yeah. um, you know, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence out there that shows that it's just not possible on a long term consistent basis that you can't help smart markets, you know, um, but people, you know, with the Internet nowadays, you can go and find anything out there that's going to reconfirm to you that you're doing the right thing um, with the investments that, that you hold. Um, and we do that in many aspects of our life. We're constantly looking for confirmation, you know, people that are similar to us, that have similar thoughts and beliefs to us. You know, we seek information that's going to tell us that we are right. Um, and look and you shall find, but it doesn't actually mean that it's the right thing for you to be doing. Yeah, very true, very true. So, uh, you know, we've spoken a little bit about those biases. How do you mm. think we can actually test if we're being led to make a decision based on a bias? Well, I've got a good example of this. Okay. So when you're doing your online shopping, for example, I'll, I'll put everything in the basket that I want to buy and I'll leave it, I'll sleep on it and go back to it the next day. And you'll, you'll find that most of the time... Um, you don't need to. You don't want it. You don't actually want it if you just stop and think about what you're doing. Um, so I think if you're really making some major financial decisions, um, just give it some time, sleep on it, think it through, um, because then that it always becomes clear in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. It's it? not an instant reaction. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the fact that the brain makes these decisions spur of the moment. It's usually after the fact that we kind of go, oh, probably shouldn't have made that decision. So, so you, that's a great tool. So just kind of stop 
think on it. Mm. You know, it's it's given it's food. given the whole brain the time to kick in. You've got the right side going, well, this isn't emotional for me. I really want to buy all these things. I'm just going to do it. But then giving it more time, it allows the logical side, the left side to go, perhaps it's not the best thing to be doing. So, you know, or, or, or it reaffirms and says, this is yeah. what you need to do. Yeah. Um, I really wanted that dress. <laughs> and two weeks later, I still want it. <laughs> That's right. But you, you've got to give it some time. Okay. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Great. Um, and finally, I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit as well about um, how the psychology of money highlights the importance of financial literacy. And this is one that we've touched on a few times now. Um, financial literacy, as we know, you know, we're referring now to the knowledge and the skills that we all need to make those informed decisions. Um, so unfortunately, we know that there's a, a large lacking in, in, literacy, in financial literacy. Um, and that can also help us, le- you know, lead to make those poor financial decisions. Um, uh, And this plays out in really simple ways. So um, simply not understanding some of those key things like how compound interest can lead to missed opportunities for saving or for investing money or not understanding that uh, with the risks that are associated with different financial products and that can that can lead people to costly mistakes. So uh, so Kels, a common scenario that I, I come across is the idea that you have to be a specialist to understand finance. Do you think that's true? Yes and no, depending on the situation. I think that you can certainly get... Political answer there. It is. I'm I'm in the wrong career. Um, Look, I think you can absolutely get a lot of gems by speaking to a specialist. And there's certain situations that do warrant that because, you know, you sometimes do need expert advice for people that have spent time studying in that area. Um, But I don't think individuals need to necessarily be a specialist. I think they need to know that it's important to ensure you're seeking the right information through the right channels. Um, a good example of this is, you know, in the in the crib room talks at the mines, we see this all the time that, you know, people are seeking information from people they think are similar to them. They're in the same job roles, the same industry, same share plans, all of these things. Um, and they give each other tips. And sometimes these tips doesn't fit the other person's situation, mm. you know. So I think you just got to be careful where the source of your information comes from. But be curious, challenge, seek information and know where the source of information is, is coming from because everyone's situation is unique too. Mm. Um, so you've got to really overlay that with how is that then relevant to me so you don't make these bad decisions. Mm, absolutely. Well, that, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, I, I suppose to kind of sum that up, psychology of money, I, f- I find it a really fascinating area of study and it sheds a lot of light on our thoughts, our emotions, some of those biases that influence our financial decision making. Um, and really to get in there and understand the psychology of money, we can become more aware of what those decision making uh, processes are for, for us and for those that we are in relationships with or spend a lot of time with and can help us make those better financial choices. So Absolutely. And I think, um, especially Especially in today's society, when we think about consumerism, you know, people are just spending and and the thoughts and feelings around money sometimes are perhaps not our own Mm. unless you really sit down and think about it. Mm, That's right. I I think um, those, you know, billboards and Mm. and internet and Facebook and all the social media, that it's amazing the level of information that gets pushed to us. That's right. We might think it's our decision. Um, but perhaps there's, there's, there's something in the background there that's been telling us or directing us to, a, to go to a certain place or to make a certain action happen. That's right. So just yeah. consciousness. Yes. Conscious money. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for listening to this podcast. We hope you found it informative and thought provoking. Join us next time on The Wealth Experience to learn more about all things wealth and life related. The opinions of the presenters are objectively ascertainable and are not intended to be financial product or personal advice.